Welcome everybody to our 18th virtual shadowing session. I am very honored to welcome to you today a physical medicine and rehabilitation resident, Dr. Thea Swenson. Welcome Thea. All right, thank you, Nina and everyone so much for being here. Um, I think this is my second time doing this and I really just love pre-health mission. And I also agree with everything that Nina said about keeping this free for you guys. Um, I'll, I'm, throughout my talk, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how I got to where, uh, where I am and what I was doing. Um, but I also think that as students, um, I wanna be able to support you guys as much as I can because I know what it was like to be in your shoes. Um, so I'm excited to be here. Okay, so um, as uh, Nina said, I'm, my name is Thea Swenson. I am a second year resident in a specialty called physiatry, which is also known as physical medicine and rehabilitation, um, which is also abbreviated as PMNR. And we're a pretty small specialty. So I wanna talk a little bit about that and about my career path here as well. Um, this is an outline of my talk. Um, after I tell you all a little bit about my path into medicine, um, I'd like to tell you about physiatry. Um, I'd like to go over a few case studies to give you an idea of some of the conditions that we see and what we do. Um, and then I'll also talk about how to become a physiatrist, why you should think about becoming one, um, and then give you some advice based off of things that I have learned um, thus far in my career. Let's see. All right, so I I was born in Los Angeles, California. Um, both my parents are Vietnamese. And when we were three, I moved, um, well, my family and I moved to Denver, Colorado, where my brother was born. And I really spent most of my life there until I left for college. Um, I went to college at Stanford University. And while I was there, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. So a lot of you are all ahead of me because I actually didn't know that I wanted to be a doctor when I entered college. Um, I had a lot of relatives who are physicians, but um, neither of my parents were doctors, and I never considered it until the end of college after I tried a lot of different things. Um, I actually thought about being an engineer or a dentist, and when I first um, got to Stanford, everyone there was so smart that I just really didn't think that I had what it took to go to medical school. So after some time trying to figure out what I wanted to do and what I wanted to major in, I found this major, it's called product design. So it's a bachelor's of science in engineering product design. And it's actually a very unique major as well. Um, it's a subset of mechanical engineering, but we focus really on human factors, creativity and aesthetics. Um, we study design theory, we work with various companies and we do a lot of stuff with our hands. So we create a lot of prototypes and um, uh, take ideas from concepts to working prototypes. Um, and I really love my major, but ultimately when I graduated in 2013, I still wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I worked for various health tech companies in the Bay Area, one of them being Doximity. So that's a, a actually physician founded tech startup. It's kind of like a LinkedIn for doctors. Um, I also did some research at the Stanford School of Medicine. And I actually stumbled upon some physiatrists or PMNR doctors at Stanford who were teaching this class called Lifestyle Medicine and Musculoskeletal Medicine. And they took me under their wing. So I started doing some research with them, got to know them, and I became a lot more interested in medicine and specifically in becoming a physiatrist. So then went to medical school at the University of Colorado and currently I'm at Vanderbilt University um, doing my residency in physiatry. So you might think that it seems like I wanted to be a physiatrist even before I went to medical school. And um, if you're thinking that you might be right. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about physiatry today so that just like my mentors at Stanford, I might inspire some of you to become physiatrists as well. So what is physiatry? It comes from the Greek words physikos, which means physical and atresia, which is the art of healing. And physiatry or physical medicine rehabilitation or PMNR is a broad field. And what makes us unique is that we focus on an organ system or as on a philosophy, sorry, we focus on a philosophy as opposed to an organ system. So other specialties that focus on like the heart or the lungs or the kidneys and the diseases that correspond to those organ systems, physiatrists focus on prevention, on restoring function, independence, and maximizing quality of life. So we're really the medical experts when it comes to maximizing function that has been lost through injury, illness, or other conditions. 
Um, we also use a really holistic approach to promote wellness for our patients um, outside of the hospital. And we really understand our patients by working with um, other groups of healthcare professionals, which I'll talk a little bit more um, about later. And we're one of the newer subspecialties in medicine. We really began to develop during World War I and through World War II and the polio epidemic, when there was an increasing need to take care of both injured vet, um, vets who are returning from combat, as well as patients who had to live with the chronic disabilities and weaknesses after um, suffering from polio. So we were first recognized as a medical specialty in 1947. And we treat a broad range of conditions and work with diverse patient populations. And in theory, any patient really can benefit from a physiatrist. So that includes everyone from your tetraplegics, stroke patients, traumatic brain injury patients, um, to Olympic athletes. And some of the conditions we treat include, in the nervous system, include brain injuries, spinal cord injuries, stroke, multiple sclerosis, and Parkinson's. And within the musculoskeletal system, we treat patients after they've had amputations with osteoporosis, arthritis, and work and auto-related injuries. We also treat pain, which that's a big symptom that we treat, and that pain can come from joints, bones, muscles, ligaments, tendons, bursa. We treat back pain a lot as well, too. And we also oversee rehabilitation programs. So for example, patients with primary cardiac and pulmonary problems, such as patients who are post-transplant, um, had a big open heart surgery, have end-stage COPD or other conditions that might be limiting their quality of life, um, we see those patients as well. So some of the diagnostic tests that are within the scope of practice for physiatrists include x-ray, MRI, CT scans, and ultrasound. Ultrasound is a very important skill for us. So in that corner, you see the um, like a portable ultrasound machine, which is a butterfly. Um, and we use those to look at muscles, joints, and tendons. And we also do a lot of nerve conduction studies and EMGs. And so that's a really unique skill to physiatry. Um, we use those things to evaluate the function of motor and sensory nerves, um, and this helps us distinguish the location of a nervous system lesion. Um, we also use EMGs to help distinguish whether weaknesses due to muscle or nerve dysfunction. Um, and the process, I'll just go over it briefly rather than show the video that I usually show, but it involves inserting very thin electrodes into the skin and detecting electric potentials generated by the muscle cells, and that helps us understand um, muscle and nerve pathology. I think we'll skip that video um, and then we'll just go, let's see, skip that video. We'll go straight to treatment that we offer. So we, as physiatrists, we don't do surgery. We treat conditions non-operatively and that can come in the form of these different modalities. So one is injection and we do a lot of peripheral joint injections, both to diagnose and to treat diseases. And this can be done under ultrasound. We also do trigger point injections as an adjunct to treat myofascial soft tissue pain. And certain specialties within PMNR, such as interventional spine, use fluoroscopy to provide non-surgical pain relief for back pain. We also manage spasticity, which is stiff or rigid, tight muscles by doing Botox injection, injections, phenol injections. And we also prescribe oral medications and manage baclofen pumps. And then we also see those um, oversee those rehabilitation programs. And like I'd mentioned earlier, we work in an interdisciplinary healthcare team. So other members of our team include physiatrists, or sorry, include physical therapists um, who help patients uh, improve their movement, occupational therapists um, who work with patients to help them improve and maintain the skills they need for daily living and working. That includes things like getting dressed and using a pencil. Um, and SLP, which is speech language pathologists, who are the experts in communication and swallowing disorders. So we're really the leaders um, on these teams. We're the ones who prescribe those therapies, just like any other physician might prescribe a medication. Um, and we also work closely with patients to provide them with adaptive devices as needed. So there's prosthetics, which are artificially made limbs that replace a part of the body that's missing, or orthotics, which are devices that are used to correct or enhance the function of a body part. We also perform other procedures such as acupuncture, um, PRPs, which are all relatively new. So now we're gonna go over two case studies to give you an idea for what it is like to work as a physiatrist and also to give you an idea for the breadth of patients that we see. So the first patient I wanna to talk to you about is one that you would see if you were working on the inpatient rehabilitation unit. So more in that intensive inpatient um, facility. 
And this patient, um, he is a 49 year old male. He has a history of leukemia and he's coming to us um, in inpatient rehabilitation after hospitalization for COVID-19. So he was hospitalized for COVID-19 is now really deconditioned and coming to us. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of medical background on him because it's also important for us to understand his whole hospital course. So he was 49 years old, otherwise relatively healthy, but he did have this diagnosis of chronic myeloid leukemia um, earlier in the year. And he had undergone five cycles of chemotherapy and was otherwise doing fine, staying pretty active and working in his yard until September of 2020. And at that time, he was brought to the ED with a one week history of generalized weakness and confusion. And since he was confused, we had to talk to his wife because um, he couldn't give a clear history. And his wife had said that he had, over the course of the week, he had become slow to respond to questions, wasn't making any sense and doing nonsensical things like putting towels into the toilet. And so he was admitted to the hospital where he underwent a thorough infectious and cancer workup. So he got things like chest x-rays, urinalysis to check to see if he had a um, urinary tract infection, imaging of his head to see if there was anything acute that could be causing his confusion. And all of that was negative. The only thing that was positive was his SARS-CoV-2 PCR test. Um, he was seen by different special specialists while he was in the hospital. Um, he was treated for um, supportively for COVID-19. And he still had this remaining kind of lingering encephalopathy or confusion. And all these different specialists, including the hematologist, um, the neurologist, the psychiatrist, they thought that his continued altered mental status was unrelated to his leukemia, um, chemotherapy or other cause. And they felt that his confusion was really due to the neuropsychological sequelae of COVID-19 infection. So after this acute hospitalization, he is now finally sent to us. Um, and before going further, I just want to take a moment to recognize that a lot had happened before we as physiatrists actually see him. Um, he was seen in the hospital. All these things were ruled out. Um, he was seen by a lot of specialists. And even though all this happened before we see him, it's important for us to understand his entire medical course because this sheds light on his recovery and where we think he's going after his hospitalization. So how long he was in the hospital and what complications he might have had would give us an idea for how deconditioned he is and how much therapy he might need. So back to seeing him in our inpatient rehab floor, some of the reasons he's coming to us include the following here. He has decreased strength, depends with his ADLs and IADLs and cognitive impairment. So ADLs, that stands for activities of daily living and those include things like eating, bathing, getting dressed, um, going to the bathroom. IADLs are instrumental activities of daily living. So this requires more complex skills and they include things like cooking, driving, completing housework, shopping, managing finances. And both ADLs and IADLs as evident in their names are important for um, living independently and for daily living. And then cognitive impairment just describes impairment in his ability to think plan or remember and learn new things. Um, so now that we understand why he's, why he's here, uh, we're going to figure out what we're going to do with him. So we go meet him and his wife, and we've already read his medical chart. And now it's time for us to understand what his life was like before he came to the hospital. So specific things in his history that we as physiatrists care about um, include his social history, and that includes the basic social history, which includes how much he smokes, drinks, alcohol, does drugs but it also includes other aspects of his social history that are more important to us or equally important to us, but that we place more of an emphasis on as physiatrists. And that includes things like his level of education, which impacts what his cognitive baseline is, um, employment, whether he works at a job that requires use of his hand muscles, um, like dentistry or machining, um, if he's up and walking around all day or, just, or if he sits at a desk. Um, and might he need an assistive device or accommodations at work if he's doing those things. We also ask about hobbies and how active he is because our goal is to get him back to doing all those things. Living environment is also very important because um, his, that impacts how safe he will be at home when he gets home, if that's the plan for him to go home. 
Um, we ask about how many steps he has at home. Um, will he need to climb stairs? Is, does he live in a home or an apartment building or a trailer? Is there an elevator? Uh, what kind of shower does he have? Because that can also pose a lot of hazards as well too. Um, will he need assistive assistance like home health services when he goes home? And then we also want to understand his functional status. So what is he doing right now? Can he get out of bed? How far is he from this goal? And is this realistic? Um, are they expecting him to go back to what he was doing, like working full time and walking out independently? So for our patient, he was a non-smoker, non-drinker. He works on a seven acre farm in middle Tennessee, and he was very active on his feet. He's driving a tractor around all day and he's working on the farm. He was a functioning independent, um, independent man who lived with his wife and two young children who also all depended on him. And knowing all these things, we now move on to our physical exam and assess how he's doing right now. So in addition to doing things like listening to his heart and lungs, we focus on the strength exam and musculoskeletal exam, as well as the neurologic exam. Um, and our patient, he has some weakness in his lower extremities as well as his arms, which is expected from being in the hospital and from being deconditioned. Um, usually we tend to rate, or we, we do rate strength on a scale of one to five with five being the strongest. So he's about a three to four in strength. He had been walking around the acute care hospital with assistance of um, an assistive device. So he will need to work closely with physical therapy to improve his strength. And cognitively, um, cognitively, though, he's very far from his baseline. He needed maximal cueing for simple commands and had difficulty initiating tasks. He was also very distractible and very far from his cognitive baseline. So he will also need to be seen by neuropsychology as well as speech language pathology to work on speaking and communication, um, who will work with him to develop routines and practice some of these problem solving skills. So our job while he's in the hospital as physiatrist is to prescribe the physical therapy, speech therapy, neuropsychology, um, as well as to monitor his improvement over the course of time. If anything medical comes up, like he becomes agitated, has pain, which is expected if he's working in therapy three hours a day, um, develops shortness of breath, um, we work this up and we also do lab testing, imaging, testing, treating as needed. So in some ways we're kind of like the primary hospitalist team for this patient while he's on the inpatient, rehab while he's in the inpatient rehabilitation hospital or floor. Um, and the thing to emphasize about inpatient rehabilitation is that it is an ongoing process. So with this patient, we eventually get him walking around the unit independently without an assistive device, but his cognitive rehabilitation is ongoing. So there's a lot of neurologic manifestations of COVID-19 that we're all still learning about and recovering from COVID-19 or any disease can take time. And the trajectory is really different from for a lot of patients. So this is really just a small slice of that time that we spend with him. Um, and we will have patients, including him, continue these therapies outpatient and we'll continue to see him in clinic um, after this hospitalization as well. Um, next, we're gonna go over a case that you might see as while working as an outpatient rehabilitation doctor. So this involves, um, you'll see that involves a little bit more of diagnosis and treatment plans that you're probably familiar with from having chatted other physicians and other specialties. But we're gonna talk about a patient with knee pain, specifically a 19 year old runner who is coming to our clinic. And um, one thing for physiatrists who are working, especially in the outpatient setting is that anatomy is very important to us. So I'm just gonna tell you really briefly um, a little bit about the knee anatomy. The knee is a modified hinge joint. Um, it's the largest joint in the body and it's susceptible to injury because it rests um, on this long lever arm, which I'm trying to point to it, but it's um, between this tibia and the femur. So the big bone, the, the two large bones um, in the leg. And um, it's a spot where it, since it rests along this big or this long lever arm, it's susceptible to injury. Um, and on top of the bones, there are the muscles, which are the knee extensors, which um, mostly the quadriceps. There are the flexors, which um, include the hamstrings, as well as your rotator muscles and the popliteus muscle, which unlocks the knee. And then on top of that, you also have the ligaments of the knee, which include the ACL, PCL, MCL, and LCL. Um, and usually, because I'm still a resident going through all these different clinics, I usually just review the knee anatomy, um, even in real life, before seeing the patient. So it's still a learning process. Um, we're all still learning, um, and I would just do that as I've done with you in clinic um, before going to see the patient. 
And when we jump in, jumping back to the case, um, when we see the patient, we, I like to use this mnemonic that a lot of people like to use, which is OPQRST. And I apply it to most patients, um, but especially the ones who come in with pain. So let's talk to this patient and we hear from her that the knee pain or the onset of the pain began several months ago, is provoked with walking down the stairs and running down hills. Um, she has stiffness after sitting for a long time and often hears popping or crackling sounds in her knee after prolonged sitting. And the pain, the region of the knee um, is in the anterior, anterior region of the knee where she has the most pain. And she rates it as a five out of 10 in severity when she has the pain. So from here, we do a physical exam. We take a look at the knee and we assess, assess for areas of tenderness, the amount of swelling and the range of motion. We can also do specialized knee tests um, if we're concerned about specific, specific diseases. So that's one of my favorite things about musculoskeletal medicine is that you can actually get a lot of information based off of your physical exam. Um, and this can help us guide, um, guide us as to whether we need further imaging. So some of those exams include the drawer tests, SAG tests, and McMurray's. Um, some of you might, may have heard about them before, but those are other things that um, we get really good at. Um, and in this patient, so now we'll, after doing the physical exam, we'll go ahead and get an x-ray to look for fractures and bony abnormalities. Um, and in this patient, especially, it'll help us visualize the location of the patella on the femur. Um, and if there's any early arthritis, I mean, she's a 19 year old, um, probably not gonna see that, but that would also be something that we'd look for an x-ray. So then we get all this workup back and we diagnose her with patellofemoral pain syndrome, which is also known as runner's knee. Um, PFPS, as abbreviated, is anterior knee pain that is due to improper tracking of the patella along the distal femur. So you can see the patella against the femur on the image um, in the right and um, improper tracking, especially after running, can cause this pain. And taking x-rays at different angles will allow us to see whether her kneecap goes off track, but our suspicion for PFPS is at least when I see this question is high just based on her history alone because she's a runner with knee pain that is worse when going downhill. It's actually a pretty common complaint seen in young women, especially runners, and it results from a combination of structural factors as well as muscular imbalance um, and quadriceps weakness. So then our job is to focus on treatment. Our next job is to focus on treatment. And a lot of this will involve activity modification and correcting any um, incorrect running form or mechanics that may be contributing to the pain. So that includes um, strengthening the quadriceps and the hamstrings, working with physical therapy, and then your foundation for most musculoskeletal complaints is the rest, ice, and NSAIDs. You can consider a knee bracing for her as well, or a patellar knee sleeve with a patellar cutout, and that can prevent um, injury and allow her to resume at a lower intensity, resume some of that activity. Um, and then taping is another thing that can be done to allow or help with proper tracking of the patella. And really surgery, consulting to orthopedic surgery is a last resort. Um, patients really come to us when they want non-operative um, treatments and we don't do surgery as I had said earlier. So if she needed surgery, we would have to consult orthopedic surgery. So um, now that we kind of understand what um, physiatrists or parts of what physiatrists um, can do, we're gonna go back to talking about becoming a physiatrist. Um, so it's a, it is a medical specialty. And um, after completing high school, there's the 12 to 13 years of training um, in order to become a physiatrist. So there's your four years of undergrad, which I know that many of you are um, doing right now. There's the four years of medical school. There's one year of internship, which is usually in internal medicine, surgery or transitional year. Physiatry residency itself is three years, and you can do a one to two year fellowship if you'd like. Um, fellowships are optional, and a little under half of physiatrists actually complete a fellowship. So a lot of times, um, medical students, but also pre-med students, like to ask me what residency is like since I'm a resident. And in general, residency programs tend to be small. So our programs range from two to 14 residents per class, and there's a total of four of us in my specific program. Um, we have to do 12 months of required inpatient rotations. And here are some of the things that we see in patients. So you see 
um, your general reconditioning, general deconditioning, um, neurologic disorders, stroke, um, brain injury patients. And then um, outpatient rotations, we do 12 months of outpatient rotations, and there can be a handful of those that we can choose from, which include amputee clinics, EMGs, sports medicine um, are some of the popular, popular outpatient um, months that you can choose from. We have um, call as well. Uh, it depends on your program, how much you take call, but we take call anywhere between every fourth night at home to um, every 11th week at home, every fourth night in the hospital to every 11th week at home. Um, and, and at my program, we take call um, at home call and most of our calls are second year. So I only take eight weekend calls and 26 weekday calls. And every year out, we take progressively less call. So that, that actually leaves me a lot of time to be involved in extracurricular activities. So this includes recruitment and helping with incoming residents, working with medical students and pre-meds and telling them about PMNR to spread awareness for our field, um, doing sports medicine research because that's what I'm specifically interested in. And also doing other pretty unique things like being involved in, if you're like a writer and you wanna be involved in medical humanities, there's always an opportunity to do those things. Um, since I have a background in engineering and product design, I'm really interested in entrepreneurship. So I'm heavily involved with the, um, it's called the Wondery. And so it's across the, um, across the street from Vanderbilt Medical School. Um, there's this location or this, there's this community called the Wondery and it's part of the business school. Um, and I'm able to work with um, the, that innovation center and mentor health tech startups, which have been founded by PhDs and MBAs and others. And so, um, even in residency, I'm able to start building my career as a resident, and I feel very fortunate to have found this field where I'm able to do these things already. Um, here's another thing to think about, just life after residency, some of the subspecialties and fellowships that you can go into. As I mentioned, it's not really required that you do fellowship um, because PM&R is a specialty itself, and you should actually be able to practice all the things here. Um, even without a fellowship. But if you wanna pursue that extra training, um, here are some of the fellowships that you can do, which include hospice and palliative care, pain, spinal cord injury, sports medicine. Um, and then there's other non-ACGME accredited um, specialties that you can do as well, like spine, um, interventional spine and research. Um, so I think I saw a question also about life or about practice settings. And I wanted to talk a little bit about life after training. Um, so physiatrists, um, and that depends also whether you choose to pursue fellowship or not, um, we work in a variety of environments and that includes inpatient and outpatient settings as well as consulting roles. So we can be consultants for um, the general medicine team on the um, inpatient acute hospital as well. We can practice in academic settings, group practices and solo practices. Um, and you might see us, some of the places where you might see us include a sports medicine clinic, neurology clinics, in the acute care hospital, in a rehabilitation hospital, and in skilled nursing facilities and others. Um, and the thing that I really love about PMNR, as mentioned, is that it is a team sport. So we work with a team of other medical professionals, which can include other doctors like neurologists and orthopedic surgeons. Um, and we can also lead a team of healthcare providers, as mentioned, that include those physical therapists, occupational therapists, respiratory therapists, and others. And there are many reasons to choose physiatry as a career choice. Only some of the things uh, have been listed here, but physiatry is incredibly meaningful and it leads to a very meaningful career. So while a lot of patients don't want to be in the hospital or don't want to see most doctors, many and the majority of our patients are excited to see us because they are, um, they want to get better. Um, it's very meaningful to work with patients who are either young or old and who are just really all along the patient spectrum who have suffered from a traumatic event um, and help them adapt to their new disabilities and get back to living their lives. We also follow these patients longitudinally, so we build meaningful relations, relationships with them. Our patient population is very diverse, so you can really choose the type of patient you want to work with, whether that's pediatrics or paraplegics. Some physiatrists also work exclusively with Olympic athletes, and if you wanted to specialize in women's health, there's also a new field of physiatry coming out called pelvic floor rehabilitation, which I know some residents who have gone that route as well. It's a multidisciplinary field, and I'd like I like to say that if you like neurology and musculoskeletal medicine, you can do both as a physiatrist. 
Um, and you can also lead this team of healthcare providers who are doing these things. Lastly, physiatry is full of opportunities. It's a new and relatively lesser known specialty, so you can make it what you want it to be. Um, it is becoming more competitive each year as people hear more and more about it. Um, but it also gives you the opportunity to have to do other things I, I'd mentioned and to have work life balance. Um, as mentioned earlier, I do have most of my weekends off and that gives me time to do other things. So if you're an engineer and you want to pursue other engineering projects or work on other things, maybe you're a musician um, and you want to do that. Um, even during residency, that's something that you can do. So the last thing I want to do is just give you three pieces of advice um, that I had wish I wish that I had known when I was in your shoes. And my first piece of advice is to pace yourself. So everyone says that medicine is a marathon and it's not a sprint and it really is because you realize once you enter medicine that the exams never end. I had actually just taken another board exam a few weeks ago and I'm already studying for my next board exam. And so I always used to tell myself that once I take, you know, once I get past this board exam, I'll be able to enjoy my life and have more free time. And that's not the case because you always have another board exam coming up. And in some ways, especially during college and medical school, I use those things as an excuse to almost to not be happy in the moment. Um, and I use the next big accomplishment um, as kind of this um, jumping block that I had to get through. And I realized that there's always things that come up. There's always board exams and that never ends. And you really have to be happy with what you're doing in the moment because life can be really short, especially seeing the patients that we see and seeing all that they go through. Um, you le really learn how to appreciate um, what you do have. My next piece of advice is to um, embrace opportunity and be willing to try new things. So as I told you all, when I got to Stanford, I really felt kind of out of my league because a lot of my classmates were, you know, very smart. They were founding companies. They were um, doing like new and innovative research. And I kept comparing myself to others and trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I tried a lot of different things. Um, and maybe to a fault, but I think all of those things make you unique. Had I not majored in product design, um, had I not taken that lifestyle medicine class, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. And I tend to think that people with the most interesting careers have been those who have tried many different things and found ways to combine different disciplines. So I've tried to really emulate that in my career. And um, I think that as pre-meds, especially now is a great time to try a lot of different things and figure out what you want to spend your life doing. And if you have any other outside interests or hobbies, I'd encourage you to find a way to maintain those um, even while you're, while you're um, in this process. My last piece of advice is um, one thing that I've really learned is that you've got to keep your family and friends close. So um, even when I was a medical student, I lived with my parents and they took me to some of my exams. And uh, even in residency, I live pretty close to my in-laws. And so they'll take me to exams as needed as well too. And they're always there to help me. Um, I call my college friends. I try to make time to see them when I can. And as you get older and as you get further in your training, you realize that that time really never comes back. Um, and it's so important to keep because really without your friends and family and without my friends and family and my mentors, I wouldn't be where I am today. Um, here are some references, just if you're interested in learning more specifically about physiatry. Um, and uh, you can always feel free to reach out to me. Um, the easiest way to reach me is via DM, on, actually on Instagram. Um, I think that there's a great community out there. And I want you all to know that, you know, even though we're physicians and a little further in our training, we're all very, um, very approachable and very reachable. Um, so you can feel free to either uh, message me on Instagram uh, or you can also find me on Twitter as well, too. So I can go ahead and take questions, um, but I also want to turn it back to pre-health shadowing and let you and um, Nina kind of tell me what you want to do now. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, if you would like to ask your questions directly to Dr. Thea, you can use the raise hand button. And if anything, you can just type it in the chat and I'll be asking it to her directly. Um, so for the first question, you briefly mentioned it, but how do you maintain your family, like your work and social life balance? Yeah, um, I think a lot of that um, goes into why I chose physiatry as well, too. 
um, I really had debated going to medical school because I was worried that I wouldn't be able to see my friends or family um, and maintain that work-life balance. And really what you get good at, especially after intern year, is managing your time well and figuring out what's important to you. So for me, I know that I really need to study for exams. And that's, I've always been like that. I just need a lot of time to study. So I start studying for my exams immediately after I finish my last exam. And, you know, some of my co-residents who may be um, maybe learn things a little bit quicker than I do can cram that all in a month before our next board exam. But I really try to pace myself and I, you know, I really embrace the whole idea that medicine is a marathon and I just kind of chip away at all the things that I need to do so that I can advance academically and in my career. But I also make sure that if something comes up and if, you know, I want to go to dinner with my friends or my family that I make time to do that. And I don't, um, feel guilty about that as well too and it gets easier as you get further along in your career but um that's how i that's at least how i maintain my balance thanks so much um we had a couple questions on your journey into uh, physiatry um first one being what is your advice for someone deciding between dentistry and medicine as you said you were considering it uh before with engineering yeah so that's a great question um so dentistry, you definitely will be able to work with your hands more. And it actually suits very well, actually, with my background, because I was interested in product design and I liked working with my hands. I think the key to deciding is to shadow both dentistry and different specialties within medicine. So I thought I was going to do dentistry and then I actually shadowed um, some dentists. And I just really realized that I wanted to focus more on the entire patient because dentistry um, straight from when you enter dental school, you're really focusing on a patient's mouth and that's, you get, you know, some of the pathology and some of the basic sciences that you would get in medical school, but not to the extent that you get in medicine. So if you're really interested in the whole human body, um, even the healthcare system, um, having a medical degree can make, can allow for a lot more flexibility. And that was one reason why I chose um, to go to medical school. Um, in engineering, if you are like I was and you were thinking, well, maybe I want to do something with entrepreneurship and helping with, you know, med tech and engineering medical devices, um, having a medical degree, whether that's an MD or a DO, really opens doors. So I spoke with a lot of engineers who said that they really, at the end of the day, you can be the expert um, engineer on the team, but they really look to someone who has a medical degree because you're actually the one who interfaces with the patient. So if you have to take those devices and bring them to the patient, you as a physician are kind of like that last, you know, barrier. You are the person who brings those devices to the patient and you really have control over whether you think that that device is something that's safe for the patient or that's something feasible and the engineers really end up trusting you. Um, so between dentistry and medicine, I would say really shadow a bunch of different specialties within medicine. You're not going to like all aspects of medicine clearly, but if you like enough of it, um, medicine is going to give you, is going to open up a lot of doors. Um, it's a lot longer of a career path. You won't be practicing as soon as your dental friends will be. Um, but you have to also realize that um, part of that is learning all about medicine and that can be fun in and of itself too, so. Thank you. Um, the next question in the chat is, how has your background in product design allowed a more creative way to incorporate it into your specialty? Sure. Yeah, so I think um, especially physiatrists are very interested since we're a newer specialty. I think some of us are more interest, more open maybe to innovation and to doing different things like being on Twitter. Um, but product design, so the idea of product design is understanding, um, using creativity, aesthetics, an understanding of human factors and what patients or people um, really need and designing products or systems surrounding those needs. Um, so it kind of requires like a deep understanding of, um, of people and their emotions and their kind of like the fluffier side of um, anthropology and psychology and designing products around that. Um, so for me, having a different background has also has actually opened up a lot of doors. So the other day I was sitting um, in the resident room and I had an attending come up and he's um, starting this new class. It's um, relating to like a, the design of healthcare systems. It's not quite mechanical engineering, but it's still, it still makes sense with engineering because it's a, like the healthcare system. There's a lot of ways we can redesign or re-engineer 
that so that there are a few problems within the healthcare system. But he just approached me and said, hey, I you know, saw you have this background. I'm teaching this class. Would you like to join or would you like to talk about it? Um, and I'd say that those having people come up and ask me those things, that's not really rare. Um, when people actually find out that you have that extra training um, or additional training, they become really interested in finding ways to incorporate it into medicine. And it's because medicine is so broad and um, you get such a such great training going through medical school that you really have the power to figure out what you want to do with it. So um, I found other ways to get involved, like I'd mentioned with working with um, different tech companies as well too. Um, but I'm still figuring that out. Awesome. Um, we had another question um, from a high school med uh, standpoint. Um, do you think it's a good idea to major in engineering or pursue a science major instead? Yeah, I think that um, certainly there are pros and cons, especially in medical school. There were times when I was sitting next to my medical school friends who um, were biology majors, biochemistry majors, and they really just knew everything that the lecturer was talking about because they had this was like their third or fourth time seeing it. And here I was, um, you know, I'd spent a lot of time learning physics and design theory and playing instruments <laughs> in college, and I had no idea what was going on. So I was scrambling to like take notes. I was I spent a lot of time studying in medical school. I think having a biosciences background is really helpful but you also have those requirements that you have to take already to go to medical school. Um, so I really think that, you know, if you love engineering, which I liked engineering, I liked physics a lot better than I liked chemistry. Um, I, I really just think you should do what you like doing. Um, you'll have to take those requirements and you can always take summer classes. You can always do other things um, to make sure you fit those requirements in. But I also think that you want to do something that will ultimately make you an interesting make you interested in what you want to do later on. So if you, and that's also different if you, you know, you want to do biosciences research and you want to be like a strictly um, like work in a lab or do go really far in a very certain field of medicine or biology, um, then it make, might make sense to do a biology major or sciences major. Thank you. Um, you said that you used to work, uh, that you work with a team. Have you seen any PAs or anyone in your team? Can you like talk about that dynamic? Yeah, um, I can talk both about the inpatient side as well as the outpatient side, because I see, I think there's some questions about um, professional sports teams as well too. Um, so on the inpatient side, we do have nurse practitioners who work with us in our hospital. Um, and they are kind of more they help us with a lot of the things that we can't, that we're too busy to do. So they'll help answer some pages. They'll help, um, you know, see patients if we need them to be seen immediately. Ultimately, since we are the doctors, we are the final, we kind of have the final say. So whatever decision is made, we have to either okay it or we have to make it ourselves. Um, but we do work with, um, you know, other, other healthcare providers. Um, on the outpatient side, especially since I'm interested in sports medicine, working with sports teams, we do work closely with athletic trainers. Um, I actually think there is a lot to be learned from an athletic trainer, as I think that there's a lot to be learned from a speech therapist, an occupational therapist, or a physical therapist, especially in physiatry. Um, and really, the athletic trainer, in some ways, does a lot of the work. Like They are hands on, they're always on the field, um, working directly with the patients, and they, um, we kind of oversee all of that and prescribe what needs to be done. Awesome. Uh, follow up to that question, uh, similar to the dentist question, what advice would you have for a student who's trying to decide between a PA or an MD career? Sure. Um, so I have a good friend who actually, um, who's a PA now, and I think that the biggest difference is in the level of training as well as what you want to ultimately do. So some of the pros and cons about going to medical school versus, um, versus going to PA is that you, they're ultimately, and you know, we're trying to change that culture because I don't necessarily believe in it either, but medicine is a hierarchy, unfortunately. Um, and in some ways it makes sense because you have a lot of really sick patients. There is someone who has to both take charge and take the blame if something goes wrong. Um, and an MD or a DO essentially, you know, kind of sits in some ways 
at the top where we make those decisions and we are fully responsible for everything that happens. So some more mid-level providers can't actually practice um, independently, whereas we can. Um, and that, you know, one of the cons of that also is that you have a lot of responsibility. So as a PA, you go to PA school, I think it's like somewhere between three to four years, and then you go out and you practice. Whereas for us in medical school, you know, you go to medical school for four years, and then you do four years of residency, then you do one year of fellowship. And during that time, you might not be doing what you necessarily want to be doing. Like I want to eventually do sports medicine, um, but I'm still getting all of this training, which I think is important, but I'm getting all this training working on the inpatient side, um, working as on the consult service. And ultimately I wanna do outpatient musculoskeletal medicine. And so I'm still waiting until I get to do those things. But at the same time, all the things that I learn working on the inpatient side, seeing all these different patients, um, it's the fund of knowledge that is different than you would get um, you know, if, you, if you went to PA school. So time is a big thing to consider. Um, and then where you want to, to be in terms of your career, are you okay with, um, kind of being um, like, do, like, do you have to be the one who makes the decisions? I guess is the big question if you wanna go the medical school route. Um, speaking of medical school, what was your personal experience in choosing between an MD or a DO program? Yeah, so I think that's a tough, <laughs> that's a tough question. I think mostly because, um, so I only applied to MD schools um, originally, I think, and I think it's changing, especially with some of the stuff if you've seen on social media as well too, um, with some of the companies and things that are coming out. But it used to be at least that, um, you know, MDs were that was that was kind of like like the gold medal, like that was that was the thing to go after if you wanted to go to medical school. Um, I think that there's plenty of reasons, um, especially for physiatrists, to pursue the DO school route because you get. Um, OMM training and you get a lot of training in musculoskeletal medicine that we don't get um, in like in as MDs. Um, but I think that at times, and I, I don't think that this is fair, that at times there's certain um, certain biases that other um, older physicians might have depending on your training. Um, but for me, I really, you know, when I was picking out medical schools, I picked the best ones that I thought I could get into, applied to a bunch, um, got into one and I went. So <laughs> I think a lot of, that's how it, that's how it often happens. I think a lot of people talk about choosing medical schools, but oftentimes medical schools choose you, so. Um, as you were talking about when you're doing your rotations, um, what were some of the signs during shadowing that indicated that the specialty could be the right one for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in medical school, I also considered hospitalists being a hospitalist. So it's like an internal medicine doctor in the hospital. Um, and we would oversee like general patient, general, like patients with all sorts of problems, but like we we're like a generalist. Um, and I'd consider that mostly because of my product design background and because I was interested in understanding the healthcare system. And, um, you know, I thought maybe I wanted to design healthcare systems. And as a hospitalist, you um, really get that broad understanding. Um, really, I think the thing that made me choose PM&R was that I liked that it was a newer specialty. So I liked that I thought I could make it what I want it to be. I liked that the focus was on function rather than the organ system, because I think that patients at the end of the day, whether you're, you know, I was involved in a lot of quality improvement projects. I tried to make a lot patients happier when they were in the hospital because I wanted their experience to be better. Um, and at the end of the day, patients really just don't want to be in the hospital. They want to be at home. They want to be out living their lives. They want to be doing you know, doing things that you and I do. And so I think that that's the reason I chose physiatry was because I wanted to learn, I wanted to be able to say that I'm a doctor who focuses on this philosophy of function, quality of life. And I have this training because we do do a year of internal medicine. Um, and oftentimes as interns, we actually do more internal medicine training our first year than a lot of the internal medicine residents who are going into internal medicine. So we get a lot of training in internal medicine our first year. Um, and I really just wanted that specialty to be able to build off of that, um, that training. Thank you. My next question is, what do you, what is your favorite part of your job and what would you say is your least favorite part of your job? Yeah. So I think, um, my favorite part of my job, um, I think that working in a team for sure. I think my co-residents are really great. They're very supportive. 
Um, it's really fun to be at work actually, because um, I think that being around, you know, a team where people kind of look up to you and they respect you and they, and you can also, you know, really be the leader in that team, whether it's working with other residents or other therapists um, is really a lot of fun. Um, that was actually a reason where for me, when I was shadowing dentists, I saw a lot of them worked in private practice and um, my mom works in private practice and that um, can be a little bit more isolating. And I really wanted to be around a group of people. So I think that that's the thing that really makes my job fun. I think patients um, having a longitudinal uh, relationship with patients and having them see you and tell you that, you know, their back pain is better or they're you know, they've been working hard in therapy and now all of a sudden, like, look, look what they can do with their hands because they've been working so, so closely with occupational therapy. That's really rewarding. Um, and it's really exciting too. Um, I think the worst part of, uh, the worst part about a lot of medicine is that we're doing just a lot of note writing now. And I don't think that that's necessarily unique to my specialty. Um, I think that, you know, there's a lot of burnout, especially now, and maybe worse because of what's happening with COVID with us having to just write notes. Um, there's a lot of administrative work that unfortunately falls to us. And um, there's a lot of things that we didn't really, you know, none of us really go to medical school thinking that, oh, we're, we wanna go to medical school so we can write notes and put orders in. Um, but hopefully that's changing. Hopefully the EHR systems get better. <laughs> hopefully that'll go away. Speaking of things that might happen in the future, uh, do you do physiatrists so, <laughs> work in a long-term care facility or transitional care unit uh, in a nursing home setting? Um, if not, where do you see them working in the future? Sorry, I missed the first part of the question. Yes, it was. Okay. Um, do, where do physiatrists usually work? Do they work in a long-term care setting or a transitional care unit in a nursing home setting? Yeah. So general physiatrists, um, so our facility right now, it's called in, inpatient rehab. It's an intensive inpatient rehabilitation. So if you've heard of places like um, Craig Hospital out in Colorado um, or like Spalding or Shirley Ryan, those are some of the bigger um, rehab rehabilitation hospitals, but that's where patients go after they've had like a big skiing or at least a lot of patients go after they've had like a big skiing accident and need inpatient rehabilitation. Um, if you want to be more of a general physiatrist, you know, your, your options are pretty broad. You can work in, you can't, you can work at a nursing home. You, you could be the medical director, for example, for a nursing home. Um, you could work in like a facility where inpatient rehab is different than a nursing home because you have the physical therapist coming in and the goal after inpatient rehab is to get them home versus for a nursing home. They're kind of, that's kind of their home. Um, you can also work in an outpatient clinic as well too. And so you can oversee outpatient physical therapies um, too. So it's, it's very broad. Um, in the future, I think more physiatrists, well, our, our specialty is growing. And I think that as it grows, um, right, right now, it's kind of a specialty that, you know, a lot of people are doing a lot of different things. And um, they're all related, because we share this um, specialization on this philosophy. Um, but as physiatry grows, I think you'll find us in a lot more places. I don't think it's more, it's limiting in the sense that, oh, in the future, Sure, you'll probably only see us, um, you know, at nursing homes or at or in inpatient rehabilitation. I think you'll actually see us in more areas in all those places, including maybe more specialty clinics and um, on the wards and stuff like that. Thank you. How has COVID nineteen impacted your patient interactions, and do you have to do telehealth now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So. Um, as residents and as a second year resident, we spend a lot of time in the hospital. So. Um, impacting us, we, see, we do see patients after COVID, um, you know, we, a lot of the things we're still learning about the long-term impacts of COVID-19. Um, it really depends on your practice setting, whether you have to see patients telehealth. I know that the um, interventional spine doctors, like the pr more procedural physiatrists, they obviously have to see patients in the clinics. Um, but that also depends on reopening policies and whether they're able to come in, um, whether, whether the community is allowing them to actually come in to be seen. Um, there is more telehealth coming, but I do know that um, more than that, I think a lot of clinics just in general are kind of um, closing down, um, especially with the holidays coming up. I think that they're just slowing down. Um, and honestly, we're just all still trying to figure it out. So um, it's kind of been in flux is what I would say. 
Sure, yeah. Um, in general, though, do patients directly come to you or are they usually referred to you? Mm -hmm. So in the hospital, so both in the hospital, actually, I think I would say that the majority, they, they can come to us, but I think the majority would be referred to us since we are a specialty and how healthcare system works, how, how our healthcare system works right now is that they're seeing, you know, you come in through the ED with a complaint or you go to your primary care doctor with a complaint and then you're referred out. So since we are a specialist, like if, for example, if you had knee pain, you would be referred out to, um, to a, a sports medicine physiatrist. Um, I think you could set it up depending on how you want to set up, they could come directly to you. But I think the majority of what I've seen is referrals. Thank you. Do you have any advice or resources for the MCAT for future takers? Sure. So I, um, I always thought that a really great foundation in chemistry and physics and biology is, has always been the key to doing well in any of those standardized tests, um, especially as someone who, um, has to study a lot for tests. Um, I think having that foundation is really the key. Um, what I used was Berkeley Review. I don't know if that's still out right now, but I started using that. And then I also use Kaplan as well too. Um, and I've heard really great things about Berkeley Review. I didn't actually take that course or use, um, take that course. I got their textbooks, but um, I didn't actually take their course, so. Along those lines, uh, do you have any advice for um, extracurricular activities that you would recommend for pre-med students, whether they be in high school or in their undergrad? Sure. I think that there are certain things, and I I always hate check, doing things just to check things off a box, but I think secretly that there's things that you have to do so that you can check things off a box so you can get to where you want to go. Um, and I think that as, um, you know, looking at medical schools, things that are important would be to be doing volunteer work, to be doing research, to be doing well in your classes. And I think that that's, that's really the basis is you, you have to be doing well in your classes um, and doing well at what you're doing right now to the best that you can, um, and then doing other extracurricular activities. And those are kind of the two things that I really think of the research and the volunteer, and then getting in um, shadowing hours to make sure that you know that this is what you wanna do. And then anything else that you want to do that makes you an interesting person and that you like doing, whether that's playing a sport or, um, you know, playing an instrument um, are things that you should be doing. And I think that when you're thinking about volunteer and research, you can also spin those to do things, to do it in a way that involves something that you like doing. So maybe you're a musician, maybe what you can do, and maybe you love playing the guitar. So maybe what you can do is you can go volunteer for a nursing home and play the guitar um, at a nursing home. And so then you have that, you know, little checkbox checked off. Um, so I, I believe that there are check boxes. I um, don't like them, but I think that, you know, you can find ways to make them likable, so. Thank you. Um, have you ever dealt with imposter syndrome and how have you dealt with sure. it? I think that's a great, you guys ask great questions. So I, <laughs> I appreciate you paying attention and asking such great questions. Um, I do all the time. And I think that's because, um, partially because I'm a female and partially because um, my residency is 80% male, um, partially because I'm um, an Asian female as well too. And I think that working, um, especially with certain populations in medicine, they have an image of what it is like, what doctors look like. So for me, um, it's uh, it can be hard, but I also think that, you know, like, like one of my pieces of advice is having the right friends, having the right family members, having the right people around you to really support you makes a huge difference. So um, at least at Vanderbilt in my community, um, I remember this one time where I had a medical student and um, oftentimes, you know, if you're with a medical student who's a male and if you're a medical student who's like with a white male, um, patients tend to think that they're the doctors and um, they kind of like look to them. And I think that more and more so though, we're, especially as physicians are getting on social media, as we're putting different faces out there um, and more diverse faces, I think that we're all aware of kind of the elephant in the room and we all don't like it and we all do things to fix it. So like my medical student, for example, um, was very aware of, you know, anytime the patient would say something, he would immediately be like, oh, she's the doctor, like she makes the decisions um, and kind of deferring to me. And I 
you know, I, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate also medical students. Um, you know, I, I don't, I, I go by my first name all the time and I tell therapists to call me by my first name and nurses to call me by my first name. But I think that there's also a point where it's like, oh, well, I have to be the doctor and I have to be Dr. Swenson and having medical students address you as doctor in front of patients really makes a huge difference and having people address you and addressing yourself as doctor makes a huge difference um, in fighting that imposter syndrome. Um, and so I think that we're moving in the right direction. I definitely have experienced it and I can tell you that I'm not the only one who experiences it, but I do know that um, other people are aware and they're, um, you know, they're helping and they're trying as well too. So um, I'm optimistic about that. So awesome, thank you. Um, next question is how competitive is residency to get into PMNR? Yeah, so right now PMNR, um, so we are one of the only specialties that didn't go unmatched this year. So in the match after, um, after medical school, um, you, you apply to these residency positions and um, there's certain residency spots for each program. And there's only a certain number of spots for PMNR, for example. And so usually it's dermatology, orthopedic surgery, and more recently it's become PMNR probably because more people are finding out about us. But um, those are kind of the specialties where there's no open positions at the end of the day um, after the match. Um, I think the difference though, compared to the other specialties with PMNR is that PMNR historically hasn't been that competitive. I think a lot of people think Oh, I'll go into PMNR if I didn't get into ortho or something like that. Um, and um, the board scores just realistically, they've gotten higher every year, but they're not high in the sense that they're as competitive as dermatology or orthopedic surgery. I think that what makes PMNR unique is that we also look at the whole person. So we don't screen out just based off of board scores. It's really if you are interested in what we do and if you can show that interest um, and have those experiences of working this with this patient population because while you know while I love my job and it's great it can also be difficult to work with a patient who you know won't just never get better so thank you the next question will be asked by Nestor okay hi Dr. Swenson uh, hi, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if you answered this uh, already uh, but I just kind of wanted to know what kind of drew you to looking to kind of specialize more into sports medicine yeah um, so, so I had a mentor, um, my mentor at Stanford, he is a sports medicine doctor. He actually recently took me under his wing because he, um, he, he just invited me to do some research with him. And I think that, you know, having the right mentors is really what ends up happening, right? It's, it's how I found PMNR. It's how you decide, you, you see someone and you're like, oh, I want to be like that person. I'm going to be like that person. And I think I, I never really thought about it before, but I think that that's how I've kind of figured out a lot of my career path. And I would also encourage a lot of you, if you have a mentor or someone you know who's a bit older than you, but who you could see yourself being in the future to reach out to them and kind of have them take you under their wing. Um, I think sports medicine is exciting because there's a lot you can do, especially with health technology. It's, it fits well with like biomechanics. Um, you know, I had briefly thought about orthopedics, but I didn't really want to be a surgeon. It's fun because um, in sports medicine, you get to do a lot of procedures um, and really working with athletes is fun. And you can work with Olympic athletes. You can work with, you know, um, para Paralympics as well too. Um, and generally, I just really like the patient population and the that it allows also for this health tech kind of um, blending of health tech as well too. So, and I think a lot of new innovations are happening too in sports, so. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Um, so the next question in the chat is, as an Asian American, was there any force in the career choice? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, so for me, no, my mom, <laughs> my mom and my dad worked all the time. Um, and I think in some ways there wasn't enough force. <laughs> I think that, you know, I tried a lot of different things. I was actually worked in consulting for a little bit, like as a design consultant and um, at, at a strategy firm. Um, and I, I think you know, I, I always knew that they wanted me to do well, but I think that they were just kind of busy. They didn't really think about it. Um, I think in some ways having guidance, um, not that they didn't guide me, but I had a lot of freedom 
them. <laughs> I think I just, um, I kind of, I we always laugh because I always think, well, I had a lot of freedom. I really could have just done nothing with my life, but then I chose to, you know, <laughs> go to medical school. Um, and I think that freedom is good. Um, I think it actually allows you to kind of be more confident in your decisions, but I also can really empathize and relate with some of my colleagues who, um, you know, are Asian American and who do have families who have high expectations and I think it is um I think it is really hard so um unfortunately or fortunately or unfortunately I didn't really have that but I do know that um you know that can be really difficult but um yeah yeah um some people are wondering what pushed you away from going to the surgery route if you could talk a bit more on that sure so I know that I want to have a family at some point and realistically um, I'm 29 now so um, and that was something I really considered before going to medical school even um, and I think that that's something that um, probably a lot more female physicians are thinking about that and worried about that than let on or than than we talk about and it needs to be talked more about but um, I think having, and I, it's not impossible, there's definitely a lot of you know even neurosurgeons who are females who had children in residency, but for me, I just knew that my husband right now works uh, works a lot, and um, I wanted to be able to have more flexibility um, and to not work those hours. And I think that after surgery residency, maybe you'll have more flexibility. But I think that the training is something that really um, made me think twice. Um, honestly, I like doing things with my hands. I think surgery could have been a great option. And I think that there are ways to do that if you want a family, but I also think you have to think about the other sacrifices that you have to make. So for me, I also knew that I had this product design background. I want to do something in engineering. I want to teach medical students. I want to do all these things in residency as well too. And I can either, you know, be a surgeon and be a mom, hopefully, or I can, you know, maybe think about other things and then do like health tech, do, you know, spend time with my friends, um, maybe have a family and do, do a lot more things, so. Thank you. Since you have a non-traditional route, you have a different, um, it's not really a pre-med um, course. And also you were, you took a gap year. Is there anything that you would like to change or do in your mm -hmm. past? Like, Yeah, um, I think that, that that's also a great question because I often think, especially when I see um, some of my, um, co-residents who went straight through and who just, um, you know, went straight through residency. i actually took two gap years. Um, I always used to envy them because I would think, oh, you know, if I had just gotten my life together sooner, I would know what I was doing and I would be two years younger. Um, but I do think that having that time off and I think there's pros and cons to both because I think that you can go straight through medical school and you can go to residency and then, um, you know, then you're just an attending sooner. But I also think that there's a lot of merit in trying different things and figuring out what you want to do because medical training is very long. And kind of once you get started, you don't, I always used to ask people these questions because I thought, well, maybe I'll, you know, take a few years off between medical school or between medical school and residency if I needed. But once you start medical training, there's so, there's such a high intensity of what you learn and what you're expected to know that taking a year off for even like a month or a semester you realize that the more time that you spend away from it, the quicker you forget things. So you just you kind of cram all this information in and then you want to go out into practice and you want to follow this path simply because um, you're going to forget it all. And you need to take all these board exams and the further you get away from learning those basic clinical sciences, the more you're going to forget it. Um, so I think that it can be really tricky, but I think that you know you have to do what you need to do. And if you want to spend that extra time and do something like working you know, there's plenty of things that you could could be doing that include research, that include working um, at a startup, that including like kind of the random things that I did. Um, but I think you, as you get further in your training, you have to be careful about when you do those things. Um, and I think that taking those gap years before medical school, um, looking back, I wouldn't change them, especially because I think that I have more opportunity now to, to do a lot more different things that I want to do because I chose a different path than I would have if I hadn't, so. Yeah, um, on the follow-up to that is, what did you focus on during your two gap years? Yeah, so I, um, 
let's see. So I worked briefly for a consulting company. It was called Jump Associates, a design consulting company. I also worked at Doximity, which is like a LinkedIn for doctors. And it's actually founded by a physician. He went to Harvard Business School, though. He was at Emory Medical Student and then went to Harvard Med um, Medical School or Business School after um, sometime between, sometime during his medical training. Um, and he founded this LinkedIn for physicians. So I worked there as a marketing um, intern for, um, for a few months. Um, and I got to know him and his team and kind of learned about, you know, other things that you can do. Like um, Dr. Gross actually didn't go to residency. He went and pursued this health tech kind of startup after, um, after business school and after medical school. Um, I also did research. So I had great mentors at Stanford who are working on the cooling glove, which is a sports medicine kind of device and um, we presented that at TED Med we went to TED X or TED Stanford X so we went to different conferences um, I traveled a lot and um, saw family and friends and just kind of did it was it was both great because I got to do what I wanted to do like I love doing everything that I was doing but it was also difficult because when you're in that transition state and you don't know what's coming next it can be really stressful so I was worried about you know kind of like I was talking about earlier I was always like oh well I just have to go to medical school like I have to get into medical school otherwise like I'm just not happy right now because I can't get because I'm not in medical school um and so I think that you know there's definitely pros and cons um but that's what I ended up doing Thank you. Um, the next question is, how, if you can answer it, if you're comfortable, sure. how many times did you apply to medical school and how many medical schools should one apply to? Yeah. So I, I think I'm a little bit unique. I applied once um, and I applied to, so I was also, because I had an engineering degree, I just wasn't you know, I, I thought I wanted to go to medical school, but I also thought, well, there's other things that I can do if I didn't go to medical school. So I didn't apply to that many medical schools. I think I applied to like, I don't know, maybe 15, 10 to 15. And I got one interview at CU, University of Colorado, and then I got in once. And so that was my one medical school that I got into. I think that, um, you know, I've known people who have applied many times, three times, actually, I know someone who applied three times and um, ended up going to UCSD, which is a very good medical school. Um, and I think it really depends on what you do during those time, during that time. Um, I think medical, you know, applying to medical school can be stressful. I think that um, if you have like a home institution, like if there's, if um, you know, if um, there's like a, a medical school where you're from, doing research there, getting to know a lot of the people, showing a good face can be really helpful. Um, I also think a lot of it is luck, quite honestly, just like a lot of things in life. Um, having the right scores can get you far. I think the MCAT is pretty important. Unfortunately, I don't believe in that, but I think it is. And then having the right people who know you and can vouch for you is important too. Um, and then persistence is another, it's another thing evidently. Yeah, for sure. Um, going back to what you said earlier about um, your route to PMNR versus surgery, um, as you're in your PMNR specialty right now, and you decided uh, later on that you wanted to be a surgeon, what kind of what would that route kind of look like if you know? Yeah, I actually have gotten that question before. I think it's an interesting question. Um, because usually we have people who are in surgery and want to come to us. So we have um, like there's a resident I know who started his ENT residency, which is a very competitive residency to get into. And he decided that that wasn't quite for him. And so now he's applying to go into PM&R. So we have a lot of people go that way. Um, I think in some ways it can, just objectively looking at it, it can be hard to go the other way. Um, I think that it depends on what kind of surgery you want to do. Because if you're in PM&R and you want to do general surgery, general surgery isn't quite that competitive, you could probably get a spot fairly easy if you're willing to go to different places and if you're not super picky. If you wanna to go to ortho though, that might be a little bit more difficult. Um, I think that the question really in medical school comes down to, do you want to do surgery? Can you see yourself being a surgeon and being in the OR? And can you see yourself doing all the things that you have to do at that point in your life to become a surgeon, which includes working really long hours, which includes, um, can be a lot of scut work for the first few years too. Um, 
So I think that um, that is more commonly what I've seen though, people who are in surgery who want to go to PM&R because they don't want to quite do that route. But if you want to go the other way, I'm sure that if you have a PM&R training, that can't, that can't hurt you, so. <laughs> Awesome. Um, you had another question about mentorship. Um, if you have any mentors now and any advice for people trying to seek out mentorship. Sure. Um, so I think that having a mentor is always important, especially one um, within um, within the field that you want to go into. And I know you can have a lot of different mentors. So um, I know that for me, my program director, who is also a male, <laughs> one thing that he had recommended or asked as if I needed a woman in mentor, like a female in medicine as a mentor. Cause I think that that's important too. If you want to think about things like, you know, having kids or um, just other things. And so what I ended up doing was I actually joined the American Medical Women's Association. So I'm trying to get more involved with them. So there's always ways to get involved. And I'm sure that there's a pre-med version as well too. Um, and the sooner you get involved, um, the sooner you can stay involved and kind of grow that, um, grow, grow programs like that. But um, I have a mentor like that. I have a research mentor who's actually um, the, men the same mentor from Stanford, actually, who I'm doing research with. Um, and then you have your friends and your family, too. But I think that kind of those two big mentors, um, for me, I found have always worked, which is someone who has the career that you think you want to have. So that would be my research mentor who um, is overseeing this lifestyle medicine um, group at Stanford who's doing all these types of research who's a sports medicine doctor that's kind of where I want to see my career but also having like a female who you know either had kids in residency can tell me how to do that or had a family sometime in a training um, who I'm still looking for because <laughs> right now my residency is all a lot of men but um, there's other ways there's certainly ways and there's certainly support that you can find and in medicine you'll also realize that we're we're all about mentorship um, so it's it can be pretty easy to just grab coffee with someone and there's only someone to talk to, so. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, we had a question earlier about research and how to get involved with research opportunities now because of the pandemic. Yeah, so that's funny because I was just talking to one of my co-residents about how we are so busy during the pandemic that we would love medical students or pre-meds or somebody to help us with our research project. So I think that a lot of, as a lot of things come in life, as a lot of things happen in life, it's really about, you know, like if you get lucky and you find the right research opportunity or if, you know, something just comes up um, that you want to do. I think as a pre-med also, and I think it's a little bit harder earlier in your training, but I always think that you should be doing, you should always get something out of the research you're doing. So whether you are doing research because this, this is going to lead to a paper with your name on it, or you're getting paid, or this is in line with your interests. Um, you know, this is like, say you want to go into sports medicine and you want to do sports medicine research. Um, then at least you're getting something out of it. I think early in my career, I just did a lot of research just to kind of do research and not, I didn't get enough out of it was basically the bottom line. Um, but I think especially during the pandemic, um, going to events like this, and then also reaching out to people, I think tw Twitter has become a big thing for, um, for physiatrists, but also Instagram. I think there's more, there's actually more physicians on Instagram than I had thought, um, but reaching out to them, I there's plenty of med students who reach out to me too and just seeing if there's opportunities, um, just connecting with them that way. Um, yeah, and there's, I mean, there's honestly a lot that, that can be done, especially now that everything's going virtual. So it's actually kind of an exciting time, but that's what I would do. Yes, can confirm pre-health shattering has been reaching out to many physicians over yeah. Instagram and Twitter ourselves. <laughs> One of our final questions is for residency, when you apply, do you still need to have research, volunteering? What is recommendation? What was the application like for residency? Is it similar to med school? Yeah, kind of like, kind of like with the exams, it never really ends because you kind of always need to have research. You kind of always need to have volunteering um, letters of recommendation. Your clinical experience, um, I mean, you'll be in medical school, so you'll have had that clinical experience. In terms of letters of recommendation, depending on what specialty you want to do, like if you want to do a little bit more competitive of a specialty or like a specialty in general, um, you're going to want to have, like even for PMNR, I had, um, you know, two physiatrists write me letters of recommendation. Um, in terms of volunteering, I think volunteering is, I don't think it's, it's not unimportant, but it's not like, I think that 
you know, you're so busy in medical school that there's certain things that you can do. One of them being is just passing your medical school classes. Like that can be a challenge in and of itself and taking all the exams. So um, I don't think volunteering is necessarily as important um, because everyone knows that you're a student and, <laughs> you know, you can only volunteer so much. But um, I also think research, depending on what kind of program you want to go into, like if you want to do a community hospital versus an academic setting um, versus like working like as a researcher, um, I think that's when the research becomes important. So even in residency, um, all those things that you'd mentioned for fellowship are still important. So <laughs> I'm looking at doing all of those things still. Um, and that's why I think it's important to kind of just um, embrace that this is your life. <laughs> um, this is the career that you've chosen and um, make it as enjoyable as you can. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, for our final question, we just want to ask, do you have any last minute advice for our pre-health students here today? Um, well, I just want to say thank you. I think that you've all been um, super, super engaging. You have great questions. Um, I'm really excited also because I think that, you know, having, especially since I've gone through so much training now and I'm all tired all the time and jaded, I think having that enthusiasm is really important. And I think that that's one reason why um, a lot of doctors reach out and want to help mentor um, incoming, you know, pre-health, pre-med students. Um, we can keep, um, we can, you know, make our healthcare system better because there's a lot of room. And obviously right now, especially with the pandemic we're in, it's revealing more and more that we just need people who are enthusiastic and who care and who want to, um, to do all the things that you guys are doing. So um, I don't know if I have any last minute advice, but I just appreciate you guys um, listening and um, I'm excited for you all and where you take your careers. Awesome. Well, for students at this time, um, I want to uh, talk to you guys a little bit about the uh, post shadowing assessment. So if you guys are interested in getting your hours verified, um, we are going to go talk about that as long as um, as well as some updates. Um, so Dr. Thea, if you could um, end your screen share, I'm going to go ahead and start my screen share. Alrighty, so students, um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, don't forget to rate and comment on the talk on our website. If you have any parts of this presentation that really resonated with you or any big takeaways, we really encourage you to let us know. Um, and that can be found on our website on Dr. Thea's page at the very bottom. My next announcement is the GoFundMe one more time. Um, please, I cannot stress this enough, please share this with other people. Um, again, we don't necessarily expect the money to be coming from our students, but we would love for our students to take part in spreading the word about our program and um, helping keep a virtual shadowing free um, for all students. Um, we very recently had a very large influx of students. Um, and so we now have to upgrade our um, you know, our website, our uh, mailing platform, uh, and a bunch of other things. So we really appreciate um, all of your support and are looking forward to continue growing our program. If you guys are interested in any leadership opportunities, you can apply to be a member of our student team. Um, you can find this on our website under uh, join me. And if you don't feel like you have enough time right now, we are all pre-health students. It's, um, there's a lot going on and we definitely understand that. But if you're still looking to get some experience, we do have volunteer opportunities open. Um, the great thing with volunteer opportunities is you can work 100% remotely um, and you can get as many or as little hours as you want to get a lot of the basic tasks done. Our spotlight student of the session today is Natalie. Um, great job, Natalie, for being able to complete our challenge. I encourage all of our students to follow us on Instagram and be sure to be reposting our um, shadowing sessions. It's a really good resource for students anywhere to gain the necessary uh, experience that they might need as they apply for their next level of schooling. I have a challenge for you all today. And that will be to go to our Instagram page and comment on Dr. Thea's post by spelling her last name letter by letter in the comments. We will go through and pick a student who is the most successful in getting um, her name down in order and completely there without being interrupted. Um, it's very, very challenging. 
with the Instagram algorithm, so good luck. Our next shadowing session is Tuesday, November 24th at 2.30 p.m. And I hope to see you all there. We do have an MD coming to speak with us. So if you are interested in um, going into medicine, that would be a great opportunity for you to get some insight. Thank you all for coming to this shadowing session. To get your certificate that verifies your shadowing hours today, you're going to go to our website, www.prehealthshadowing.com, and you're going to go to Dr. Thea's page. When you go to her speaker's page, you can find this under the, um, the events tab for all sessions. Once you're there, um, you can take the quiz. The quiz is actually 30 minutes um, that it'll be open rather than 15. Um, once you're taking the quiz, if you pass it with a 70% or higher, you will be eligible for your certificate. If you have any questions, oh, no. can you guys hear me? I think I cut out for a sec. I'm sorry about that. If you guys have any questions or concerns, feel free to email us at info at prehealthshadowing.com and we'll be sure to get back to you as soon as possible. This concludes our 18th virtual shadowing session. Thank you all for joining and have a great weekend.